Greetings friends and welcome to Enigma Night Gaming. My name is Liara and I will be your guide in today's adventure. Today we are playing The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles and in today's episode, well, we've just put Gina on the stand. How is she going to do? Is she going to crack the case or is she going to crack under pressure? Well, let's hop in and find out, shall we? Alright, so she has nothing to say. The articles that Mr. McGill did had deposited in Windebank, Windebank's pawnbrokery are intimately related with the omnibus case, the trial of which was heard in this courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Our testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGilded. She's, she's afraid we're about to betray her. The omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. And now, here we all are again. The same players in that trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along London's winter streets. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged, that the murder in fact took place above the defendant's head on the roof deck with the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Miss Lestrade whose testimony bought, brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Miss Lestrade was concealed under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Uh, then immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilded died in this very courtroom in the most extraordinary of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on, as indeed does the omnibus murder itself. Be that as it may, I recall neither the disc nor this small box being mentioned in the course of those proceedings. Miss Lestrade. She's still not saying much. Would you tell the court now, please? What really happened in the omnibus two months ago, I mean? I don't know what you mean. I already said all of what I know. And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell? Now the moment of realization hits. Please, Mr. Lestrade, this is extremely important. But, but... Remember, little girl, if it transpires that you willfully withheld information in the trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. Hmm, perjury or murder? Hmm, I think I'd rather go for perjury. And naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts, you have little credibility to lose. Jenny, don't listen to him, please. You have to trust Runo now. Uh, Iris? We're on your side moment of truth. Alright then, I'll talk. It's the right choice, Gina. Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell-bent on bringing the entire courtroom down about its ears. So be it. I must confess that I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. However, it would appear that Mr. McGilded's pond articles and that extraordinary case of the omnibus harbor secrets of which we have hitherto un been hitherto unaware. 
Indeed it has. So, Miss Lestrade, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth, a commodity sorely lacking in your original statements. This is it, then. Everything's going to come out. Like Van Zeek said, this could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears. But as a lawyer, I'm prepared to take that risk. We gotta do it for Gina. Alright, the real truth of the omnibus case. Here we go. Truth is that Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the omnibus the whole time. When the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over my head, and that pair on the roof deck went off to call the slops. That's when Mick Gilded slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop roundabout. He threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen or heard. Good grief, this is outrageous! What you've just told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then there's... there's every chance. I may have adjudicated an error in McGilda's trial. It sounds very much to me as if the man deliberately deceived this court in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without a doubt, your lordship is correct. A great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The actions of the accused in that trial, of this witness, and of my learned friend are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it. The whole trial was a farce. It was all lies. That McGilded fellow was rotten to the core, just like the pickpocket. Don't forget that lawyer from the East. They were all in it together. Yeah, wrong, the lawyer, Mr. Naoto, the lawyer there. He didn't know nothing about it. Humbug! I don't think so. Are we really expected to believe that? He really stitched everyone up, didn't he? With an, what an operation to get the man off scot-free. Unforgivable. Stop. The lies have to stop. Stop. Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However... It's imperative that the court allow the witness to elaborate on her testimony. Because the significance of McGilded's pond articles must be brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Given the depths of calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may be worth hearing. May well be worth hearing. Words fail me. This situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Naruhodo. Yes, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. But I mean, Mr. Naruhodo. Now, counsel, proceed with the cross-examination. All right. So, we, we have to cross-examine our own witness, okay? Truth is, that Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the omnibus the whole time. Let's make sure to press everything. And you were hiding in the cabin at that time as well, weren't you, Miss Lestrade? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats? Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at, at all. Now, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claimed Mr. McGilded was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, my lord. That's... that's what he told me I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Were Mr. McGilded and the victim acquaintances? I don't know. But I did hear him talking a lot. What were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well, but if I had to say... I 
think it was about money or something. They kept talking about buying and not buying. Perhaps business dealings of some kind. Well, anyway, they got louder and louder. They started to sound like a proper fight. It was pretty... I was pretty scared by then. I hardly dared to breathe. And then all of a sudden... I heard a noise like someone keeling over on the floor. It was blooming loud and all. And I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah. That's what gave me away. When the Irish men dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. Hold it! Was the disc you saw this disc? Yeah, I reckon it probably was. It was right next to the cold line on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know, but McGilly picked it up pretty smartish. And then he sat the gold with a knife in his belly up on the seat. What did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about what I'd seen or heard to no one. About the disc and all. I was dead scared. The way he was looking at me, I thought if I didn't go along with it, I'd get stuck with that knife too. Mm. Then he started asking me a load of questions. Like what my name was and where I lived and that. He asked me about being a diver too. But after a while, what happened in the carriage was noticed. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, first there was a kind of rapid noise. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over my head, and the pair on the roof deck went off to call the slops. Hold it! There were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, I believe. That's right. Yes, it was them two. They must have looked down through the skylight and noticed the cove with the knife in his guts. When they screamed, the, dri the driver pulled up the horses and Miss Gildy got me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to an halt, the two coves from the roof ran off to fetch the slops. If they immediately left to fetch the police, it would appear they were entirely unrelated to the incident. Mm. So that left me gilded, the driver, and you still at the scene. Yeah, only the driver didn't know I was there, cause I was under the seat. I heard the cabin door open and a voice from outside. The driver, yes, he also testified in the trial, I believe. It was so cold. A fellow who went by the name of Beppo, if memory serves. What did McGilded and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened and stuff like that, mainly. That's when McGilded slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop roundabout. Hold it! That pawn shop obviously being Windabanks on Baker Street. J just a moment, Counsel. D do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony at the trial as well? Perhaps the excursion to the pawnbroker has slipped his mind when he was in the stand. Indeed, Lord Van Zietz. McGillian took off his coat and gave it to the driver. He folded it up all careful-like before handing it over. When I saw him do that, I remember thinking, that coat and what's in it has got to be worth a few bob. Yes, Gina was sure the disc must be worth more than Mr. Windebanks was suggesting, wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the price that afternoon at the pawnbrokery. The driver looked pretty happy when McGill did flash some brass on his face. He went running off out, out of lick. Then the bog trotter called to me and told me to come out from the drag's cabin. He threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing uh, to no one about what I'd seen or heard. <laughs> Threatened you how exactly? Told me I'd only be able to scarp her if I did exactly what he'd, what he'd said. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. 
Yeah, that's it. And there was one other thing he said. Which was... He told me I have to, uh, I have to hang on to this ticket from the pawn shop and make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Well, I never! So that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off me before two months passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in love, to stop it being forfeited. He left me with some brass to pay for it. But really? Why on earth would Mr. McGillan have done such a thing? Depositing his overcoat with a pawnbroker before the arrival of the police? It makes no sense at all. There would seem to be only one logical explanation, my lord. What McGill did had the driver deposit at Windebanks was something he didn't want the police to see. Something very important that he needed to hide at all costs. Anyway, after that, he let me go, so I legged it before the coppers showed up. Well done, Gina. I can't. It can't have been easy to tell the truth like that. Ginny's really put her faith in you, Runo. Yes, and to thank her, she'll have to face a charge of perjury once this trial is over. So I need to use the time we have now to get as much information out of her as possible. It's time to really go for it. Press her on every statement. I... I suppose I should. Oh, and another thing. What's that? Take a look at those two. Isn't it strange that they've been whispering to each other the entire time? Yes, that is strange. It looks like they're having a secret discussion about something. I'm not sure. I'm completely comfortable with that. I wonder if there's anything I can do about it. Alright, let's see. Truth is, the Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole time. Alright, can we... Let's see. I'm gonna press... We've already pressed once, but I want to see if we can slide over to them and ask them what's going on, right? Alright. So, let's, uh, whoops. Go back. Let's look around. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. What's going on there? Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Gregson and Mr. Graydon? Hello? Inspector! Mr. Graydon! What? Blimey, you're trying to give me a heart attack. You've been whispering to each other for quite some time now. Tell us, what is the discussion about? Discussion with this fella? Pull the other one, sunshine. You think I've got anything to talk about with a shady jet like this? I mean, you obviously did. And I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. But you did. But they've clearly been talking the entire time I've been cross-examining Gina. It's as if they've been negotiating. What is going on? Thank you, Miss Lestrade. Thank you, Counsel. I've heard enough. I believe we now have a reasonable understanding of what actually transpired on the Omnibus. It would appear on that night two months ago, a negotiation was taking place on the Omnibus. A negotiation concerning this disc. However, matters did not run smoothly. When the parties involved began to quarrel over price, McGilded took what he wanted by force, at the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point. The disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way. Although I don't understand why as yet. And two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, the gilded coat and its contents were due to be forfeited. Well, I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the cove died right after his trial. I knew that. So you decided you would try to claim the articles as your own? Well, why not, eh? They were only going to gonna be forfeited. Why should I have got them? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. Thinking ain't no crime. Miss Lestrade, it would appear Mr. McGilded was prepared to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Do you know why that would be? 
Eh, I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of brass. It was probably gonna sell it. And you can't blame me for thinking that. Thinking ain't no crime. Hmm. Why do I feel like he needs some serious Tylenol? He's got like a major migraine going on from all this shenanigans. My lord! The evidence your lordship requested has been located and is ready for the court's inspection, sir! Boy, we have the little box. Now, I bet it's a music box that will play the disc. That's my guess. But we'll see. The mysterious little box deposited by McGilded two months ago. There's no doubt in my mind is a key piece in this far-reaching puzzle. The music box. So this is the article in question, is it? The small box deposited with the pawnbroker by Mr. McGilda two months ago. And on the night of Mr. Windebank's murder. The only item on the shelves that was touched by whoever broke into the shop. Quick, quick, let's open it and see what's inside. Yep, I knew it. It's a music box. Good gracious, this is no ordinary box, it seems. Wow, although in truth, I had an inkling that might be the case. <laughs> it would appear that the box has a miniature movement, music box movement. He's not happy. Then is it too much to expect? Do you think, I think it would be reasonable to assume that it is a device for the playback of this disc, my lord. Are we finally going to hear what's on the box on the disc? So here we have the means to play back Mr. McGilded's disc deposited at Windy Banks at much the same time. Not strictly correct, my lord. It was not McGilded's disc. It was the disc of his victim in the omnibus. But why, for heaven's sake? Are we to understand that the brickmaker was trying to sell this music box disc to Mr. McGilded? Does it, is it related to the newspaper article that we saw that was talking about state secrets being sold? Was he secretly trying to sell McGilded state secrets? I don't know. I believe the answer will become clear if we listen to the music on the disc, my lord. Yes, very well. Let the court now listen to this curious disc at last. Wait, my lord. Great, what is the meaning of this, Inspector? Uh, the music box on the disc, uh, and the disc, uh, um, well, uh, unrelated to the case. Uh, no, no need to spoil the somber atmosphere in the courtroom with some silly bit of music. Objection. If they're unrelated, what's the harm, dude? The disc may very well have motivated the culprit in this case to commit murder. Clearly, there's every chance that it's fundamentally important to understanding what happened. The prosecution has no objection. <laughs> but, but no, that piece of evidence is police property and... Clearly, Scotland Yard has some vested interest here. But it is policy of this prosecutor to leave no avenues unexplored. And you, Inspector, have no jurisdiction here to prevent that from happening. Yeah. <laughs> no further delays, please. Play the disc. Oh boy, what are we going to hear? It's Morse code! What? What on earth? That's certainly not what I would call music! No. It's just the same note playing over and over again in an irregular sequence. Hmm. <laughs> Mr. Graydon? <laughs> this, this really is priceless. After all that, the music box is broken. I don't 
think so. Broken? It it can't be, can it? Oh, obviously. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised. If the officer sent to fetch it didn't drop it on the way back to the courtroom. Well, with much regret, I feel the court must accept that this music box offers little in the way of clues. Are you ready to move on, counsel? Come on. Yes, alright. It does sound as though it's completely broken, but is it? Of course it's not. Could this music emanating from the music box possibly be a new clue? It could be a clue. It's a code. If not Morse code, then it's definitely a, a clue. I believe that it could be relevant, my lord. Good lord, but... But how can it be? It's an abomination, Council. Mere noise. I fail to see how it could have any meaning whatsoever. It does sound strange, I agree. But there's one thing bothering me. While Graydon stands there chortling victoriously, the inspector beside him has a rather telling expression on his face. It's as if Gregson recognizes the sound, as if he's familiar with it somehow. And that's making him appear extremely on edge. If that's the stance of the defense, my Nipponese friend, answer me this. Oh. Just what relevance do you propose this woeful chiming has on this case? All right, what are we going to what option are we going to have? It's the defense's belief that the sound emanating from this music box is not supposed to be music. Just because this is a music box, it doesn't necessarily mean the sounds we're hearing are music. Well, look at that. The smile vanished from Graydon's lips as soon as I said it. I'm on the right lines here. I must be. <laughs> Making deductions based on how people react to what you say. You're acting just like Hurley, Bruno. Objection! The sounds we're hearing aren't necessarily music. Well, now that you've told us what they are not... I'm sure the court would like to hear what they are. Do you enlighten us, my Nipponese friend? Well, um... Surely you have an idea in mind, because if not... It will be the death of your ill-formed argument. Exactly! The music box is clearly broken, refusing to accept that fact is pure foolishness. They've got me. I don't know what the answer is, yet. Um, Bruno? I've just examined the music box very thoroughly. And I'm fairly certain that it's not broken at all. Really? Really, the way it's been made, it can only produce a single note anyway. Thank you, Iris. Okay. Alright, well, if the music box isn't broken, it must mean that the sounds it's producing have some significance that isn't musical. Come on, let us say it. Know the answer. Ah. Could it be? Is that what these sounds are? Something just struck me, Bruno. I feel like recently, in the past few hours even, I've heard another sound very much like the one this music box makes. Yes, it's a familiar sound. It's the telegraph. Actually, Iris, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. I'm going to have to press the defense for an answer. If your assertion is that the sound produced by this music box is not in fact music at all, then what the devil is it, counsel? All the evidence we've seen so far, all the testimony we've heard, it's all pointing to one single answer now. The prosecution demands that my learned Nipponese friend presents proof now. Tangible proof of this latest wild speculation. 
Do we have evidence in the court record, though? That I don't know. All right, then. This could be the best chance I'm going to get to fight back in this trial. And if I'm right, I'm, it's going to join all the dots together. The evidence that explains the true nature of the sounds on this music box disc are... All right. Do we have something related to the telegraph? Um, let's see. I mean, I don't think we have anything. Let me look at this. Uh, this says what? Uh, does it talk about this being telegraphed? Uh, there's a sensational story down lower down the front page as well. Look, Ministry Mole. Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice? For a 10 year old, Iris certainly has her finger on the pulse of the world news. It's about secret communications between Great Britain and its allies. Apparently, they're being intercepted by hostile nations. Communications are being intercepted, but how would somebody be doing that? That's the question, isn't it? I've come up with three different possible methods so far. Are you looking for a new career, Reno? No, of course not. I wonder. Perhaps this is what Lord Strongheart was talking about yesterday. Yes, it could be. And it could explain why he has Grexy running from pillar to post at the moment. Okay. The details of today's paper have been updated in the court record. Alright. Um... So, is that the evidence that we need? I'm guessing it is. The morning's paper, which contains an article about government secrets being leaked to foreign agencies. Let's let's try presenting it. Take that! Today's paper, Council. The headline is Pawnbroker Perishes and Paper Splendor. Hardly supportive of your cause. Uh, no, my lord. I was hoping you'd look a little further down the page. Further down... Ministry Mole, classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Yes, this is a very serious matter being investigated at the highest level, I understand. I have heard that the international transmissions along supposedly secure lines are somehow being intercepted and leaked to various other countries. And presumably those transmissions are in the form of wire telegrams? Of course. Juror number five, your input, please. Stop! Oh, me, sir? Whatever is the matter? You told the court before that you worked at the same communication station as Mr. Graydon, did you not? Uh, yes, that's correct. And the particular station where you work? Deals with government communications and newspaper reports? Oh, yes. We're not your run of the mill communication station at all. Our work is extremely important. Then tell me, is this not a very familiar sound? Hmm? You, you don't mean to say, is it? That's right, madam. It bears more than a passing resemblance to the sound made by your telegraph machine as you tap it. I believe it's called Morse code? But I don't believe it! Now correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to leaking telegrams from a government department, there can be nobody more perfectly placed than a highly skilled communications officer. Uh, are you suggesting that the music box disc? Contains stolen government secrets and Morse code? Indeed we are. Order! Order! Please everyone, order! But this, this is... This is High Treason Council, deserving of capital punishment. Too much new vocabulary. What is treason? And what is capital punishment? The sort of words I'd half expect you to know. For our sovereign government's confidential information, hostile nations would surely pay almost any price. Yes, and on that night two months ago, that was the very negotiation that was taking place inside the omnibus. But in the end, McGilded perished, and the all-important disc lay unclaimed in the pawnbroker. My word! 
In which case, whoever stole that information in the first place must surely have been beside himself with worry. Because if the disc were to be discovered before it found its way out of the country, it would reveal an act of high treason punishable by death. So the culprit had no choice but to retrieve it. And in order to do that, he would have to gain entry to the pawn brokery illegally in the middle of the night. Because the article left behind by Mr. McGilded would incriminate him too much if it got into the wrong hands. Isn't that right, Mr. Graydon? That moment when you're caught red-handed. You, you think I've been stealing government secrets? Preposterous! Absolutely preposterous! So, in response to the fence's accusation, you claim complete innocence, do you? Well, of course I do. I've had to stand here in silence while that pretentious foreign lawyer, foreign lawyer has been prattling away. Objection! Then by all means, counter the charges, sir. The prosecution demands the witness testify in response to the accusations brought by the defense. Oh boy. Delighted, I'm sure. What lies you gonna conjure up now, sir? The witness is reminded that the crime under scrutiny in the trial is the murder of the pawnbroker, Mr. Windebay. That being a most... I have no idea how to pronounce that word. Fudgigious? Fudgigious? Offense, for which the law of this land sanctions a capital punishment. But the heinous act of high treason is no less a serious, a serious a crime. I urge you to bear that in mind as you testify, Mr. Graydon. So then, let us proceed. It. You may. Uh, what? Hey, gotta let us have a rabbit and pork air, Governor. We got things to say. I... I beg your pardon? Who do you think you are? Name's Nash Skulker. Occupation is professional baddie. Name's Ringo Skulker, but we ain't baddies enough to sell out our motherland. That's right. We're what they call... The Three Skulker Brothers. <laughs> Bad timing, fellas. Very bad timing. Nothing like a little comedic levity. Alright, Graydon's counter. A mere communications officer couldn't possibly steal confidential government information. Besides, the sound produced by that music box aren't even Morse code. It was some low-class brickmaker negotiating with McGilded anyway, was it not? I've no relation to the man. Look, all we've done is break into the gaff the other night, like what he told us to do. If we'd known there was dodgy government secrets involved, we wouldn't have touched it. Oh boy, we got a lot of information to process here, guys. They're both like, where's our, where's our headache pills? Everyone doesn't know what to make of this. Um, Mr. and Mr. Skulkin? Well, Mr. Odu, Governor, what's up? Do I take it that you now admit to the crime? That on the night in question, you did indeed gain entry to the premises illegally? And moreover, you did so as a party of three in collaboration with Mr. Graydon here? What? We did, Gov, we did. <laughs> Quieten down, please. What do you say to that, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two ruffians are referring to. You little rotter getting us mixed up in all this monkey business. You never said nothing about no government secrets. I, well, it was supposed to be a straight up job. And what about the geezer whose shop it was, eh? Poor old Brooke didn't have to die, did he? Uh... Nice to know who your friends are. 
Whatever these men say, I deny the accusations. Indeed. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting this little music box to become so significant in the proceedings. However, as it has, I will admit it into the court's record as evidence. Alright, we need to check that out. As soon as we can. Alright. So, before we start the counter, let's check out this music box. See if there's any hidden things about it. All right, so we got the note, right? See how the form of gilded disc sits in the music box the man deposited at Windebanks? It couldn't be a more perfect fit. So there's no question then, the disc was designed to be played in this music box. Yet, despite that, it sounds the sounds it produced are neither musical, nor do they appear to have any meaning. It just doesn't make any sense. I wonder if perhaps there's more to this music box than meets the eye. Maybe we haven't discovered all its secrets yet. Let's keep looking. We got a little lever here. Can we push that lever? This is the mechanism that turns the bumps uh, on the disc into sound, isn't it? Yes, the movement. It's all thanks to the comb with its teeth that are plucked by the passing bumps. Usually the teeth on the comb are different lengths so that each one produces a different tone. But this comb is very strange. All the teeth are exactly the same length. Well, what does that mean? It means that no matter which tooth is plucked by the passing bumps, the music box will make the same sound. I've never seen a music box like it before. Yes, it is strange. A music box that can only play a single note. There has to be some significance to that, surely. Alright, what else do we have? Is there anything, like, what's this on the bottom here? Oh. What is it, Runo? I've, I've just noticed something about this music box. It looks like the bottom of it opens up as well. Uh-huh, you're right. Well, come on then. What are you waiting for? Let's open it. All right then, here it goes. Are there more discs? There's another one. Look at that. There's another movement on the other so underside. So, does that mean you can set another disc to play back on this side? Yes, I think so. And it looks like the two movements are linked together. They're linked? So if you had two discs, they would both play back at the same time. Hmm. Is there anything else we can discover? Who'd have thought there would be a second movement on the underside of the box? And this movement is like the other one. The comb's teeth are all the same length. So this movement also only produces a single tone, like the other one. Yes, it must do. Except that the length of the teeth on the two combs isn't exactly the same. So the single tone produced by this movement will be different to the single tone we've already heard. What? Basically, each movement can only produce a single note. But the notes they produce are different. A music box that can only play two tones. Oh, that's going to be short and long. that's definitely going to be Morse code. I wonder, hmm, I wonder if we end up using that to prove um, that it can play Morse code. So let's go ahead and press him. A mere communications officer couldn't possibly steal confidential government information. Hold it! Really? So, is this newspaper headline accurate? Government communications are being intercepted? How could I possibly know? What do you mean by that? Any important government communications are handled by high-level officers, by specialists. General members of staff in the station where I work would never be entrusted with sensitive information. Oh no, stop. You must say something. Stop! Let me guess. Juror number five. We regular communication station officers aren't as lonely as you're being led to believe. A team of us are responsible for setting up and testing the telegraphs used by the ministry. And Mr. Graydon is their team leader. That's fascinating. He doesn't like this. Graydon is a highly skilled operator. Stop! 
currently in the presence of Idol. Stop! So you had access to the equipment used for these confidential communications, Mr. Graydon. Oh, well, what of it? The transmissions are always made behind closed doors so they can't be er heard. And in any case, all messengers are sent in cipher. Normal employees couldn't possibly understand them. Oh no, stop! Must say something, stop! Mr. Graydon regularly attends meetings with ministry technicians and the ministry communications team. He assists them in ensuring there are no errors in the important international communications. And he's received the top prize at the Cypher Cracking Convention five years in a row now. That's fascinating. <laughs> when you get screwed by your co-worker. Graydon is highly skilled operator. Stop! Currently in presence of Idol. Stop! Percy got stars in her eyes. Well, your idol would appreciate it if you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> she should really pick her idols more carefully. I tell you, this lawyer's accusations are completely unfounded. Are they now, though? Besides, the sounds produced by that music box aren't even Morse code. Hold it! It's because there's only one sound, right? They're not? To anyone with a brain, it would be blatantly apparent on listening to that music box for even a few seconds. Of course, of course! <laughs> Surely it can't be that my learned I I friend is unfamiliar with Morse code. Ouch, he looks genuinely shocked at my ignorance. Ha 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 I would be more than happy to demonstrate the basics for you, sir. Uh, a lesson here in court? Morse code is a continuous series of two distinct tones. Tones, you say? Yes, a short dot and a long dash. By combining those in different ways, you construct letters. I see. For example, this is A. This is B. But when you listen to the sound produced by this music box, you hear only one tone, don't you? But, but it sounds so similar. The rhythm of it is the same in everything. But there's no discernible meaning to this apparently random sequence of sounds. So your assertion is fundamentally flawed. This is not Morse code. No. <laughs> Really, you shouldn't be so surprised. I wonder if the music box can actually open up and play the disc in between it somehow so that one disc can be played by both at the same time. I'm not sure. What did I tell you? The music box is nothing but a worthless piece of scrap. Perhaps you might consider studying your subject matter before casting aspersions in the future. Ugh, stop. I have nothing to say, but stop. Oh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Iris? I mean, if the government secrets were somehow being leaked using the music box, so many other things would slot into place so nicely. Could there still be something I haven't considered? Would it really be impossible to use this music box to somehow play back Morse code? Uh, give it a try. There's still every possibility that this music box was instrumental in the leaking of government secrets. That's the belief of the defense- OBJECTION! Does it please you in some way, my Nipponese friend, to repeat the same line of argument ad infinitum? It's already been established that to be Morse code, two tones are required, dots and dashes. Yes, I'm well aware of that. Then what? Oh, it would appear the defense has a hypothesis to put forward. You had better present your idea at once, counsel. How do you propose that this music box, which appears to produce only a single tone, could have been used to cipher secret messages into Morse code? So we're gonna flip it. 
can we open that? All right, so can we present this? Got it. Good gracious, what am I looking at here? Another movement on the other side of the music box. What? It appears, my lord, that the two movements are linked together. In other words, you can put two discs in this music box. And the sounds of both will play back at the same time. Good heavens! As the chord is heard, Morse code comprises of two tones, a short dot and a long dash. With a second disc in place, this music box could be used to generate Morse code and convey a message. Boom. This is beyond a joke. I'm sorry? This poor excuse for a lawyer has absolutely no evidence to support his claims. Though, of course, if my learned friend were able to present the court with the second disc, that would be another matter. Well... I... Uh, I can't at the moment. And may I remind the court that, as the witness has pointed out, he was not the one in the omnibus with McGilda two months ago, striking a deal over the disc or discs. Indeed, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. Exactly. I had nothing to do whatsoever with it. Although it has holes, I must admit the argument presented by the defense has much promise. I believe the cross-examination should continue. The link between Graydon and the victim of the omnibus case must be there somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. Oh, oh dear, it looks like you need to give your argument more strength, Bruno. You will reiterate your testimony if you please, Mr. Graydon. If I must, though I maintain exactly what I did at the start of this point in this cross-examination. Alright, so, are we starting all the way over? Oh, no, we're... It was some low-class brickmaker negotiating with McGilded anyway, was it not? I've no relation to the man. Oh, let's press him and find out. So, two months ago, in that omnibus, McGilded killed the brickmaker and stole the disc. Mr. Mason was a single man with almost nothing to his name. It seems he lived in an artisan quarter some years ago, but people there remember little about him. That doesn't make much sense though, does it? How would a humble brickmaker come to acquire secret government information? How indeed. There must have been somebody else involved behind the scenes in all this. Somebody who acquired the disc and gave it to Mr. Mason in order to take it to the meeting with Miss McGilded and negotiated a deal. Dear me! You may have a dent for me, sir, but I assure you I have far more class than that. An old brickmaker from an artisan quarter and this well-to-do communications officer. If only I could find some evidence to link the two of them together. If you have nothing more to add on that note, let us return to the witness testimony. Look, all we did is break into the gaff the other night like what he told us to do. Hold it! Like Mr. Graydon told you to do, you mean? That's it, yeah. Well, eh? Silly me, thought he was just popping over for a natter after all them years, but the rider had a dodgy job for us. Ooh, maybe he's gonna give us the connection. Eh, Ash? He had a past in the artisan quarter, right? Let me stop you there, Mr. Skulkin. After all them years, you say? Do you mean to tell me that Mr. Graydon is an acquaintance of yours? We're the sociable kind of baddies, you know? Sure, hmm. let's, let's say Graydon's in old China. Uh, what do you have to say? Excuse me. Is something wrong, Mr. Skulkin? Eh? No, the other Mr. Skulkin? What, Ome? 
When your brother was testifying just now, he said something that seemed to cause you to react. Oh, I was just remembering the old days, that's all. We used to have a right old laugh together way back when. Together with Mr. Graydon, you mean? Yeah, with Ash, I mean. You look at him now in his fancy whistle and flute. Are you wetting Adam and Eve it? But when he was younger, he was from the poor part of town, just like us. Is that so? Well, he was always a leery one. He had the brains. He had the savvy. Always coming up with smart ideas. What, like, uh, like what you would never have gone through our it. Go on, blind me. Ain't that the truth? Remember Milverton and Skulk and Milk Run? That was a cargo, eh? Save it until after the trial. Your reminiscing has no place in this courtroom. And neither does your fruit. Aye, oh, the geezer asked us a question, eh? Ain't we, ain't we was answered? Yeah, we ain't done nothing wrong. Nevertheless, the court is not prepared to accompany you on your trip down memory lane. Counsel, can we turn our attention back to the testimony, please? I don't know. Could that sentimental story be relevant somehow? Absolutely. Absolutely. My lord. Yes, counsel? The brother's last sentimental statement could hold vital information related to this case. I think that'll give us the link to the brickmaker. Very well, counsel. I will permit the brothers to supplement their testimony with that detail. Briefly, I'll hasten to add. Say no more! A skulkin's never skulkin! They're so funny. Milvita has skulkin's milk one. God, them were the days. Hold it! I'm sure I'm going to regret asking, but what exactly was that? Some kind of business? Just a little scheme we had going back when we was youngsters. A bit of fun, really. Delivering fresh milk to the locals, that's what it was all about. That sounds alarmingly legitimate. There must be a catch. I suppose since we're here, I should ask them to elaborate. But on what? Um, the business name. Why was that last name there, right? I think so. So this business was just a bit of fun, you say? And it was just yourselves and Mr. Graydon involved? Yeah, that's it. Milverton and Skulkin's Milk Run, was it? Yeah, that's it. And where did the Milverton part come from? Oh, right. I thought a oh, clever clogs like you'd have worked that one out. That is... Enough of this. How much longer are we expected to listen to this? Let me guess. You don't accept anything these two witnesses are saying? Of course he doesn't. Tell me, why is it that it was only at the mention of the name Milverton you decided to interject? But... Because I, well, it were the happiest of homes that one came from. Yeah, his old man was struggling for money so much his wife walked out on him. She took the name Graydon then, see? But I shall always be Milverton to us. Milverton. So that used to be your surname, did it? Of course not. This is all bunkum. I've been a Graydon since I was born. Do you really think you can rely on the testimony of these two thieves, hmm? I don't know, they're being more honest than you. Here, a communications officer attached to the civil service. As such, your personal details will have been thoroughly checked at the time of your appointment. It would be a very simple matter indeed to subpoena those records, Mr. Graydon. Uh, well, it would appear that Mr. and Mr. Skulkin's testimony has been reliable, for once. You were born Ashley Milverton, then? Is that correct? Very well, yes. 
So Ashley Graydon was once Ashley Milverton. That information could change things and could turn out to be extremely important. Ashley Graydon's personal profile has been updated in the court record. Okay, his last name was Milverton. Is that the connection? What was the last name of the brickmaker's name? All of a sudden, we seem to be up to our necks in a serious matter of national security. Although all this talk about interception of secret government messengers is still just conjecture at this stage. It would explain a number of things though, wouldn't it? The negotiations Ginny overhead on an omnibus two months ago, and the break-in at Windebanks. But the trouble is, it wasn't Mr. Graydon in the omnibus with Mr. McGilded. No, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker who was so horribly murdered. Is his last name really Mason? Hmm, if only there was some link between the two men somehow. I know, but Mr. Graydon's testimony seems to be as watertight as ever. I wonder if the key to us making headway in the cross-examination here could be those two brothers. McGilded case notes. Let me look at these again. Maybe there's something here. <gasps> oh! His last name is Milverton. Okay, okay. We got you. We got you, my friend. Okay, we got him. There is a link. They're related. All right. It was some low-caste brickmaker negotiating with McGilded anyway, was it not? I've no relation to the man. Is that is that really really true though? Uh, let's. Uh, where is McGilded's case notes? Right here. Uh, I do believe Objection. that's not true, sir. Mr. Ashley Milverton. Tell me. Why did you try to hide your former name from the court? Because I haven't gone by that name for years. It means nothing to me. No, I don't think that's the real explanation at all. The truth is, you had a reason to hide that name. <laughs> we got you now. Explain yourself, please, counsel. I have here the notes from the omnibus case, my lord, and as we all know, the victim, the man we now understand to have been negotiating with McGilded, yes, Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. That's right, only Mason wasn't his surname at all. It was his given name. His full name was Mason Milverton. Mil Milverton? Do, do you mean to say, Saints Alive? Mr. Ashley Milverton. Is not the case that the brickmaker, Mr. Mason Milverton, was your father? I, I, I don't. As I believe I mentioned earlier, your family history will have been thoroughly checked when you joined the civil service. And it really would take no time at all for the court to subpoena those records. Ugh. The truth is, you have been illegally acquiring highly confidential government information and selling it to McGilded in collaboration with your father. Ugh. We got you. Surely, surely, surely we've got you now. The new facts and evidence unveiled by the cross-examination of this witness all come together to reveal the truth. The, the truth, you say? that you collaborated with your father, Mr. Mason Milverton, in illegal dealings with Magnus McGilded. By dint of the music box, you mean, counsel? Yes, stealing information being sent in government secret, uh, secret government communications and selling it on to McGilded, Mr. Graydon concocted this elaborate scheme of using two music box discs to encode the information as presumably a safety measure against the information falling into the wrong hands. And a very effective one. I shouldn't have given the scheme any credence, what, any credence whatsoever. But the deal with McGilded went sour and the brickmaker met his end. 
Yes, but before he was arrested, McGill did manage to do temporarily dispose of the stolen disc at the pawnbroker. Then, having learnt of the situation, you appeared at Windebanks two days ago. In an attempt to recover the, the two articles Miguel had placed in pawn there. He has nothing to say. But that attempt failed. One of the discs was seized by the police and the other you never found. So that same night, you enlisted the help of the Skulkin brothers and broke into the pawn brokery. This time, determined to recover the second disc. Are, are you suggesting that the second disc was inside the music box? Eh? We, we never knew nothing about that. On the night that Mr. Windebank was killed. Just the music box was moved. So I think he opened it and took the disc. The intruder to the pawnbrokery touched one item and one item alone of the music box. Was rather ingeniously demonstrated using the two prints from the security camera and deed. So, the question that naturally begs answering is this. Why was only that one article disturbed? The answer is obvious because it contained the second disc, which the intruder was desperate to retrieve. Since if it were to fall into the hands of the police, it would be proof of high treason. Well, Mr. Graydon, do you deny that all of this actually began on that fateful night two months ago? He's not going to say anything. I, I, I refuse to accept any of this nonsense. Do you now? Sir, is he bleeding on his arm? There appears to be blood seeping through the sleeve of your jacket. Yeah, I thought I saw that. What? Ah. Uh, two nights ago. We know that three shots were fired at the scene of the crime on Windebank's pawnbroker. One took the life of the pawnbroker himself. One struck the pouch around Mr. Sholmes' waist. And the final bullet... struck the calendar wall of the shop, having first pierced the arm of one of the intruders. Mr. Graydon, that wound on your arm that you seem to be trying to hide, it's a bullet wound, isn't it? He's got you now, me old china. Time to call it quits and quick, I reckon. Tisk. Don't acknowledge my presence there under any circumstances whatsoever. Those were my terms, remember? And I paid you handsomely to comply. Clearly, I was a fool to think I could trust some common backs on thieves. Fine, I admit it. I was there in Windermakes that night. I paid this pair ten guineas to accompany me. And as you've noticed, I sustained an injury in the course of my adventures. Oh boy. But that is all. I admit to nothing more. Stealing government secrets? Negotiating with Mr. McGilded? As God is my witness, I'm sure I recall nothing of the sort. He's not gonna go down without a fight. Not until I can show him hard evidence, I suppose. Nevertheless, the defense has now established a crucial fact. Which is... Well, we know that one bullet was fired from each of the two firearms we have in evidence. The bullet from the Skulkins brothers' gun hit the pouch around Mr. Sholmes' waist. And the bullet from Mr. Windebank's gun clearly must have been the one that caught Mr. Graydon on the arm. Indeed it must. We can rule out the possibility that the man shot himself. And that leads us to only one conclusion. Mr. Windebanks was shot by a third gun. Which can only have been fired by the third intruder. Goodness. That's right, Mr. Graydon. 
Grrr. <laughs> the only person who could possibly have shot Mr. Windebank that night is you. Man. Hold it. What now? <laughs> you little upstart. You made a grave mistake when you summoned me here. Do you have a gun? Are you going to shoot us? What? What's that supposed to mean? Yes, as you rightly say, I was there at the pawnbroker's. I did my best to hide the fight naturally. I had no intention of ruining the distinguished career I had built for myself at the communication station. But did the thought never cross your mind? Did you never consider the possibility? What? What do you mean? What thought? What possibility? A possibility that if I was there at the scene, I may have witnessed the crucial moment. He's going to blame one of the brothers, isn't he? The other brother. You see. This makes me a key witness in this case, and I have my hands firmly around the neck of your client. What? Are, are you suggesting? I saw it all. I saw the very moment that pickpocket girl pointed the gun at that poor defenseless pawnbroker and shot him. What? You liar? Order! 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 Well, it would seem we are finally entering the last act of this theatrical trial. Mr. Graydon. Yes? I trust you are fully aware of the implications here. If this is shown that your claim is false, you will have incriminated yourself as the killer. Oh, I understand fully. Then I must ask you to give your formal testimony once more. You will explain to the court precisely what you saw at the moment the defendant allegedly shot the victim. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Oh, man. But, you know what? That will be in our hopefully final episode. We shall see. But uh, that is where we are going to stop for today so man so many revelations have been revealed he is definitely our killer he is like the gina didn't have a motive like it's so obvious to me but we will explore his story and poke holes it, it's like a, it's like a boat like there's so many holes and it's just sinking faster and faster and he just cannot uh get free of drowning fast enough but we'll see how well we do in the next episode so if you like this kind of content please make sure to like subscribe follow share all that good stuff if you want to watch live we're on twitch at twitch.tv slash the r27 i have my schedule posted in the about and in the description and if you want to see which games i'll be playing each day i post them on x.com slash the r27 and i hope you join me in the next one until then guys bye